You know, so even the search engine for this thing, you don't even need to search through the music you've already written. It just generates you a piece of music on demand. You set that up, feed it a million NVIDIA cards, and then just go down the pub. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever thought about what it would be like if artificial intelligence took over the world? That's the copy we got when we used AI to generate an intro for this episode. Scary, prescient, you decide, dot dot dot, and now. Bad Voltage. We've talked quite a bit about artificial intelligence over the years and Bad Voltage, but we typically talked about it in a very... Um, kind of philosophical manner. We've talked about the implications of AI. And today we thought we'd dig into the reality of AI as it stands today in April 2021. Um, and kind of what it looks like, is it working? And we're probably going to get into some of the broader implications of it because that's what we do. Uh, but uh, And this is based somewhat on an experience I had with a piece of software called copy.ai, which I'm going to get to in just a moment. But um yeah, so why don't we start out with Act? You had a couple of interesting examples of a what was that thing with the pictures with the faces? Right. So, um there's a there's a website called this person does not exist.com and you go to it and it shows you a photograph of a person except it's not an actual photograph taken from life. It's a thing taken from uh generated by an AI, a thing called StyleGAN. And it wouldn't i don't think it would occur to anybody that these are not photographs now the thing isn't synthesizing them out of whole clock they kind of cut they kind of a whole cloth they kind of it's been fed a million billion kajillion photographs and so it's synthesizing out of bits of other photographs it may not be <laughs> that, <laughs> actual actual numbers may vary <laughs> but the, the thing that i found simultaneously amazing and a bit disappointing about this is it's kind of a parlor trick right i mean you can see how how this would be useful if what you want is a shed load of faces of people who aren't real and therefore can't sue you for using their face or whatever then this is handy but it's not actually all that useful outside that to me this is um like have you seen ai dungeon i haven't no it's bas- basically of course a, not. basically a text adventure, um, but it's being uh, it's being generated on the fly by an AI, and it's sort of interesting to play. And you can you can play and go, oh wow, this is all generated by an AI. That's interesting. So you sort of wander around, and it understands the kind of things you're typing into it, sort of in the way that AIs do. But it, and again, you can draw a line in your head from here is a parlor trick example of a technology which could presumably be put to good uses um but a lot of what we've seen up to now has been this sort of thing where it's kind of oh that's cool but how's it actually useful and there hasn't been that much in the way of use of actual ai techniques for real doing real work rather than as demos or as parlor tricks or as one theory stuff so th- there's a couple of things one that fascinated about- me about john bringing this up i didn't mean to cut you off but it, it, it's no, so go on brand he was amazed by the the site that that i just referred to uh and i went and researched it this site's been around for years and years <laughs> um, but what's more well, interesting I'm though sorry, I'm sorry Jeremy that I am not familiar with every page on the internet the internet's got quite big in recent it, it years has I'm not quite like, up to date with them all the yet. so if you go to which face is real if we still have those TV shows by, by the way if we still have those TV shows where like someone would say let's talk about Link of the Week <laughs> it, it would make it much easier so I don't know if you also saw oh wow <laughs> weirdest and wackiest uh, i don't know if you <laughs> no, saw no, that, which that, face that was... is real which is the implementation of this where it's a real face next to an actual uh, an actual face next to one generated by this person yeah. does not exist and they are pretty easy to discern when next to each other i think on their own they would be difficult to discern next yes. to a real face they are 
surprisingly easy to to pick out the subtle that's, differences. You're talking that's about the fair. ones on this website, this person does not exist.com? So, uh, which face is real is also from Nvidia. And they take a site, okay. they take whatever the current image, because uh, this fa- this person does not exist, generates a new image like every two minutes or something. They take whatever the current right. image is and put it next to a Creative Commons licensed real face. And they ask you to pick, is this real? Yes or no. I'm looking at the, this person does not exist po- photo of this very friendly looking lady. And I'm looking at you two. And I keep looking backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards, and I cannot cannot tell the difference. That looks like an actual picture. So I encourage you to check out the site where they're just nothing but next to each other, and, and it's surprisingly easy. Yeah, really. I did get okay. one we, out of twenty right. wrong. I, I didn't go through it too long, but um, which face is wow. it, it, it's a which face is real dot com, and I'll link to it in the show notes. Okay, hang on. Which face is real? I also tried to oh, light up StyleGAN just out of curiosity using NVIDIA Docker and PyTorch, and it immediately hard locked my Ubuntu machine. So don't do that. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, I didn't actually know. I, I, um, we should probably fill in a little bit of the technical background here, but I want to be abundantly clear about this. This is not an episode where you should learn or where you will learn how AI works. We have no intention of going into it because A, we'll get it wrong. B, it's really boring. C, there are a million um, AI explainers out there on the internet. And D, there's a huge yawning gulf between people doing talks where they go, this is like a neuron, but in code, and and a thing which generates faces, right? And I don't fully understand. Yeah. I, I, I have attempted to run some of the GAN stuff. So um, uh, this person thought it's based on a, a, a GAN, Generative Adversarial Network. And yes. what's interesting about this is not necessarily the way it itself generates faces. It's the way they train it. You get two models, right? One which makes new things like faces, and the second one which attempts to tell real ones from fake ones. Yes. Um, so doing right. it, playing essentially which face is real, right? Yep. And then you train them together in lockstep. So the they become the, adversarial to each other. Yes. Yeah, so, so so it is adversarial. The um one is trying to outlearn the other, and then when you hit the point where your um your face generator is generating faces that your your fake face identifier is failing to tell from real ones 50% of the time or better, you go, cool, we're doing well now. And that, I think, is interesting that it's not just how we model the thing. Most of the AI explainers and so on I've seen have been about, do we accurately model a brain? Um, do we do uh, you know do we have neurons with activation potentials or whatever, however we do that? But a lot more of it seems to be going into how we train the thing rather than how we actually model the very low level stuff presumably in the same way that if you're a school teacher um and you want to imbue someone with a sense of civic responsibility you don't start at the level of neurons to work out how right <laughs> you know one thing that i think we, we we should take a minute what well two thoughts one is while you were talking i went to that is this face real site somewhat interestingly um i got about half of them wrong and i wonder whether do you remember that whole like blue red dress or whatever that thing was like five years ago where people see saw the dress color differently it was, it was either blue and black or it was um yeah yeah <clears throat> i i wonder whether some people are just more naturally wired up for spotting the difference here like where jeremy's probably a lot better than i am so i think it's probably because you are half paying attention and half recording this show if you're deliberate about looking for weird artifacts or one very common one on females was two different earrings there were a couple very subtle things that were consistent throughout but once you once you see them you within a half second you could pick it out now but i do think we should take a moment to just this is really fucking impressive these faces right i mean people have talked about the uncanny valley for years and these faces look pretty damn real um i'm sure that there's small mark i mean it seems like 98 percent of the problem has been you know solved to a reasonable degree and when act showed us this when we did our planning call for this show which yes folks we do planning calls <laughs> believe it or not um i was astonished i didn't realize that it was anywhere near as close to this because you can always tell when something's a bit off right but it seems like it's pretty close right so i mean that's a that's a, that's chalking one up for ai i'd say uh, well you see i but i think this is exactly the point and why i want to get on to the next thing is exactly because 
you say, uh, but now the problem is 98% solved. But what problem? I need a shed load of faces that aren't actually of real people. It's not actually a problem anyone has. Right? <laughs> a problem that people have might be, I want to be able to make a movie with uh, Humphrey Bogart and Tom Cruise in it. And this is, so- you can see how this is sort of a step in that direction, but not really. To me, there's no AI in this at all. It's all ML. Well, uh, now here is here is a very interesting question. Uh, this diverges us slightly, um, so I'm going to mention a thing, and then we're going to come back to it uh, because I want to talk about copy AI first. Okay. But did you see the thing with Banjo? This was a month or so ago. So there was this company called Banjo, who uh, a big AI company, and okay, they. I, I don't know the details of the court case. There's some kind of um, case about them doing a load of work with or for white supremacists. And okay. So I, I, so I don't know the details. Ironically I, titled Banjo, then. I, 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 don't, I don't even really <laughs> understand what it was the company did. But what was interesting was they'd got a bunch of money for the AI work they were doing. And then it turned out they weren't doing any AI at all. <laughs> what, were, what, what were they doing? Just hating black people? Well, I mean, well, well, uh, well this, this, this is the thing. I think um, it was kind of, um, they were writing code like other people were. But part of the thing was, you know, their algorithm is discriminating against people. But they didn't have an algorithm which was making decisions on their behalf. It's just someone had written code to do it. So there was no AI at all. But they said we're doing AI, presumably because that way you get a bunch of funding. And if you say I'm just writing Python scripts, then you don't. Um, so but so, so I, I want to come back to that point and Jeremy's point about how much, of, how much AI is there and is it just ML? And how much ML is there and is it just not even ML, right? If if you just ha- if you just type import PyTorch at the top of a thing, does that make it ML? Da da da. Yeah, or what? Because, because yeah, everybody says AI ML and and like in descriptions. All the oh, yeah, so we should get into that. John, for sure. I, I um, so the thing you brought up about copy to AI to me was one of the first times I've heard of an example of someone attempting to well claiming that they're using AI for a real product up at the shop and they're not making a big deal about. Um, hey, we're AI pioneers or something. Like, no, this is a real task that normal people want, and we're just yep. using AI to provide it. I said they're not making a big deal. The firm's called Copy.ai, so they're making a bit of a deal out of it. Yeah, there is, there is some level of deal involved. But, yeah. but would you like to describe what this thing is? Because it seemed, it, it seemed more f- that it fits into a normal person's life it's a tool that they might use which seems doable with ai and maybe not without yeah so i i stumbled on this first of all about two or three weeks ago um you know i've been building out this training side of my business as i've mentioned and one of the things you need to do is you need to write uh, copy and especially sales copy right how do you sell something which i'm not good at um so typically when you do something like that you'd hire a copywriter or you'd do it yourself um and there's a, a comp- couple of these companies who are claiming that they've created tools that, that will generate copy for you, um, which is attractive because copywriters cost money. So <clears throat> the way copy.ai works is that they've got a bunch of types of copy, right? So like I opened it up here, for example, product descriptions, Instagram captions, Facebook ad text headlines link descriptions they've even got things like landing page hero text subheader text uh, blog ideas blog intros blog outlines so there's all kinds of different types of copy and the the way it basically works is that you put into it a product or a brand name and then a description um which is you know a longer description you hit the create button and it spits out some copy now unfortunately cuz they do it like they have like a 7 day trial of this my trial actually ended yesterday from what i can tell <laughs> um but i did go i used it and i was actually quite impressed with what it came up with my expectation here was um it's going to get you most of the way there and it's going to get you thinking creatively about how to present information but it's not going to write perfect copy i don't believe that we're anywhere close to that. But it was a lot better than I expected. So what I did, so we've got an example for the show, is I went and found a YouTube video um, because I can't log into my copy.ai account because I've 
seven day things expired. Um, so an example that um, a guy was writing is he's got a um, he's got a product called Selva, which is a virtual co working space for indie hackers, right? So he wrote into the product brand name Selva. A vir- and the description was a virtual co-working space for indie hackers. Join a community of other makers and get the camaraderie and accountability that you need to blah, 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 right? And one of the options in there is called pain agitate solution, which is a common copyright method, which is where you say, here is a painful thing that you've got. You agitate it to show the implications of what happens if you don't fix it. And here is the solution for how you solve it, right? So for example, if the pain is, you know, no one's buying my product, If you agitate it, you say, well, if no one buys your product, then you don't have a business anymore. And then the solution is, here's how you go and sell more of your product. So, (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Proving design methodology. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And my problem is I don't have any ice cream. The solution is go and buy an ice cream. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks, machine learning. But carry on. (laughs) If if anyone's a copywriter, listen to this. I'm sorry. Um, (laughs) So for this dude's virtual co-working space, for example, pain was, this is the copy that it sped out, frustrated by isolation and loneliness while on the road. Agitation was, as an indie hacker, you easily get distracted when there's no accountability. You're your own boss, so it's not someone yelling at you to get to work and your buffer is pretty high. Steps to freedom. Use Selva as a place to plan meetings or share feedback. Save time by spending less time traveling or being lost in crowded coffee shops. Get the benefits of working in a co-working space without the cost and time it takes to maintain one. Select the number select the number of days per month that you want to work from Selva or book a designated day to either sit or stand desk. Right. So it's it's pretty pretty impressive that from indie co working space it managed to get things like, you know, being stuck in a busy coffee shop, blah, 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 blah. I'll give you another example for Selva, which was the landing page hero text. This is usually the big text you see at the top of a web page. And he literally just put in a virtual co working space for indie hackers. So these are some like strap line landing page lines. One was virtual co-working for indie hackers. One was work from anywhere. Another one was the best place to work online. Another one was a home for your projects. Another one was where geeks go to work. And there were some stylistic ones like work, period, together, period. So that's the kind of stuff that it spits out. It's not necessarily 100% there. It's kind of like Jeremy's point about the the faces. If you really look at it, and this is not as good as the faces. Like it, you can see the flaws in this, yep. but it's surprisingly effective, I think. So, but you need to go and edit and fix but it. But you would not pay forty nine dollars a month for it. I mean, if I wasn't hiring a copywriter and I was doing it all myself, I probably would. Okay. Um, but I've decided I'm I'm hiring a copywriter because I just think I'll get better results. I don't think this will bridge the gap to where I want to get to. But I think for a lot of people, this is. It's perfect. I, th- I think I think that's the thing. I mean, um, copywriting is a real job. Micro copywriting is a real job, which is separate from copywriting. Um, and yeah. it's um, both of them are jobs that people think they can do when they actually can't. You know yeah. how <laughs> you know how um, design is the thing where a lot of people go, "Well, I'm not a very good designer. Well, we better get a designer for this." Quite a lot of people think that they're a good copywriter with no evidence <laughs> and almost everybody thinks that they're a good micro copywriter you know producing the text on buttons or a w- less than a sentence thing and i know a couple of people who are professional micro copywriters and it's really hard to do well <laughs> really hard and you can't even convince most people that it's actually a job no one even thinks about it at best your designer's doing it for you and it's like you said designer, are you a micro copywriter they're like well sort of but it's not my job <laughs> I, I mean i'll give you a, a concrete example of this i wrote like for for one of these training courses i wrote the sales page which explains why someone should buy the course right yeah and it's boring and didn't really sell many <laughs> um so um i Registered with copy.ai, I was like, oh, I'll use this thing. And one of the big challenges with with copy.ai is that it doesn't, it won't spit out like a full page, right? It'll give you paragraphs of bits and pieces here and there, but it doesn't, it doesn't really build the story. So when I hired this guy to create the the copy for it, and he sent me the copy, and I compared what I'd written 
<clears throat> thinking, you know, I've been writing for years, right? And I thought I can. I, I mean, you are a, a professional writer. You have been paid. Mo- right. You have been paid money to write. Now, whether this, whether the fact that people have paid to pay for your writing is a guarantee in itself that it's high quality is a whole yeah. different question. <laughs> yeah, that's a whole. But, that's well, that's a separate show. <laughs> but it is. But 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 you are a professional writer, and I think you are not bad. <laughs> <laughs> that's that seemed like it was going to be that's, such a heartfelt, heartwarming like, compliment, and then it yeah. was it was not that. Nah, I, I, Once I, again, I, a right angle to yes. I, 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 I'm being very unfair for comedy purposes. You're a good writer, man, and but but, but this stuff is hard, and it's not the kind of writing the, you do. But well, and that's the thing. When I saw the copy that the the professional copyright had written. The, the thing that really stood out was, first of all, it's way more interesting. It's way more exciting. But most importantly, and this is where I think the AI tools are going to struggle, is it had a narrative to it. Yeah. Like he started out with, he did, he broadly did the pain agitate solution thing, but it was much more, it was much better weaved together. Um, and that's where maybe copy.ai and these AI tools, it's basically really good autocomplete from what i can tell well um, th- that the fact that you say that is really interesting because um copy.io is gpt3 under the covers as i understand it do you mm, un- do you mm. know how gpt3 works because i i didn't until i went and looked this stuff up i um, I, I looked it up and i failed to understand it well, so well, you should probably explain to it. be clear <laughs> again don't try this explanation on your AI professor if you get vivid for your PhD or anything. Well, this is like the <laughs> <laughs> this is this is the um, Rudy Giuliani version of AI explain- explanations. I, but oh, um, boy. <laughs> um, that's a heck of a statement, so, right there. So it's uh, it's a neural network language model, but the way. As far as I can tell, and this is massively oversimplifying, the way it works is, did you ever see Disassociated Press? Oh. Long, long time ago. Yeah, it's built into, long it's time built into ago. things like yeah. Emacs, and it's kind of related to things like Eliza where uh, and Markov chains, where you feed it a bunch of text, and then it'll, put, it'll identify things like pairs of words. Um, so it learns when you say this word, you quite often say this one after it. When you say this word, you quite, so if you train a thing to say, um, learn about pairs of words. So when you say and, you quite often say the after it. When you say the, you quite often say sweet shop after it. When you say sweet shop, you quite often say going after. I don't know why the hell I'm just coming out. This is Markov chain inside my head. It's weird. But if you, if you learn about all those pairs of words and then you set it going by giving it a word or a half dozen words and then just let it free form, it does exactly what you're saying, like autocomplete. Like all these things on Twitter where someone says, type in, um, the thing I'm going to die from is and then let autocomplete finish it. That's essentially a Markov chain, right? That's essentially what Disassociated Press does. It's, it's essentially what Eliza used to do, you know. Um, the so for those of you who are young enough that you didn't come across Eliza, <laughs> this was um, uh, it were it, it was a computer algorithm designed in the sixties, possibly even the fifties, as a mockery of a particular method of psychoanalysis, where you would hear what a person said to you and essentially repeat it back to them in the form of a question. Um, with the idea that this would elucidate more feelings about it. So if you actually use Eliza, you'd type in, I've got a spoon. And the computer would respond to you with, what is your spoon like? And it was sent and once you play, uh, and once you played with it for a while, you started to work out how it works. And it's basically just doing a sort of mathematical transformation on the sentence you gave it. But that was kind of how, I think it's called Rogerian psych, psych, psychiatric work or psychoanalysis. I, don't know why, but the guy who built this um, this computer program back in the 60s did it partially as a sort of dig about how mechanical this method of psychiatry was, uh, but also as a method of showing, look, we maybe we could have computers do this sort of psychoanalysis for people rather than trained psychiatrists <laughs> if, it's, if it's this mechanical. <laughs> and if you play with it, like, when you first start playing with it, you're like, wow, it asked me questions. And then I respond to them and it seems to understand me. And the illusion that it gets you is quite strong for about the first half dozen sentences. And then you're like, oh, I get how it works. Right, fine. Um, And to me, GPT-3 is basically this, but turned up to 11 million. 
and I- I'm sure a bunch of AI researchers are going to have a contract taken out on me for suggesting this. <laughs> but as far as I can tell, this is part why um it's quite good at producing things which sound plausibly real because it's learned from a bunch of existing text. It's not generating um meaning out of a vacuum. It's essentially hopping around between texts it's already read. But part of the problem with it is this is why um bots based around this sort of methodology tend to lean towards being racist. You know, if you if you, if you train up a GPT three thing and then ask it about a particular racial identity or something, it will roll out a bunch of things and you're like, uh what? And that's because it's. Is that because it's found it, more information on the internet that's racist? It's because it, it's because it's read stuff, or, and it all goes into the hopper. But it has no sense of this is good and this is bad. I mean, obviously, so it's, basically, obviously it's, it's a, a populist way of doing I'm AI, saying, but right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, right. and that's the thing. It's essentially stringing together sentences which it's seen already, or bits of sentences which it's seen already, or things which feel like things it's seen already. And that's why I think it's quite good at coming up with little bits that seem good for copy um because it's it's kind of picking up bon mots that other people have already written or plausible sounding sentences as a starting point it's like but like you say it's not doing an overall thing because it doesn't really understand it's essentially playing a jigsaw game with with language and synonyms so it's good at thinking up riffs but not writing a song it's it's a it's an interesting demonstration of what large-scale machine learning can be but it's not yeah. some revolutionary AI advancement. Yeah. So, so just so I'm clear on this, so are you saying, Act, that um, you believe that GPT three is going to the kind of material it's going to spit out is going to be based upon the prevalence of what it finds online, which is the racism thing? I'm presuming it found more racist content online, therefore that's what's the prevalence of what it's been fed, not what's found online. But yeah. Yeah, yeah what it's been fed, and also I don't. But what has it been? Fed? That's what I want to know: is how what is fed to it. To be clear, I don't necessarily know that it's prevalence. Um, I, I do, okay. I, I, I would not say because I don't know and I don't think it is that it's literally just doing a popularity contest among things that it's read. It may be things which, uh, whatever its optimization function is for why should I pick this to go next rather than this or whatever. It's, I'm assuming way more complicated than just popularity. But the point is that all of this stuff goes into the algorithm hmm yeah it seems to me like that the primary purpose or the primary utility of something like copy.ai is um is it's like a bit of a creative injection right so if you say okay i need to write some i need to write a, a tagline for something that you can pop in what you're doing and if you're feeling a little bit creatively dry it will give you some things and ways of presenting information which are different and and interesting, but you as a writer need to know that that's interesting, right? <laughs> you need to you know you need to know what what good looks like for it to work. It's kind of like listening to music and hearing great music, and then oh, I'll take that and well, put it into my own music. That's exactly why I just said. Um, I think it's probably not too bad at making up riffs, but it couldn't write a song. That's a great way to yeah, yeah. Uh, so they did. They did actually use data from the web because they're using Common Crawl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, at least some of it is. It's not just book corpus, corpora, and so on. There, yeah. There's a bunch. There's a bunch of web stuff in there. Um, but that I th- I think is interesting. It, it is folly to predict that a particular job will not be taken over by computers because or by technology because every time someone says that it turns out that they were wrong <laughs> yeah but that's mechanical jobs i the question I, I, is whether no, is, you see i don't think it is my man <laughs> what's a create what, what's a creative job that's been replaced by a computer i don't know yet maybe nothing um, That's because it hasn't happened yet. Yeah, right? but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's not going to happen. Uh, sure. I think what John was asking is, do you have an example currently of it having oh, right. have happened in the past? I see what you mean. Right. No, I, I don't think so. Um, but I think part of... Well, part of what happens is the world shifts so the, so the previous jobs no longer become necessary. It's not like um, if you ask a 60s person um, what... W- would people who work in shops be replaced by um 
technology, they'd have gone, absolutely not, because how could you ever get a robot to walk from behind the counter to the shelves and back again? Right. Like, yeah, fundamentally yeah. misunderstanding the problem, which is that what you actually want is just give everyone contactless, have a thing in the Amazon shop, which registers when you pick up something off the door, and then you don't employ any shopkeepers at all. Um, and, to, and to some extent, this is, I think, the same. That, yes, if someone's ho- if someone's whole job is creativity all they do is they're given a situation and they're asked to recast it in their own words that are most appropriate and most successful so they are a copywriter or a micro copywriter or a journalist or something like that or a professional writer then yeah their job is not being replaced with a python script anytime soon but i think lots of bits about their job may be being replaced with a python script fairly soon who who, write, who writes the headlines? Who who's the editor who chooses which article goes up front? Who does A, a- B testing on the number of people who come to the website and check all that stuff? So, all that stuff's automatic now. I think anything that is fundamentally process driven or that r- r- that involves fundamental pattern matching is very likely to be automated away, right? So, for example, you, a good example is A B testing, right? That's something that somebody can do. But in terms yeah. of the writing the content that is being A B tested. I, I I think part of the part of the joy of creativity is that it breaks patterns, right? Um, is that? But I, I I think um you're casting a very narrow net for creativity. So to give you another example, think about someone who works on a help desk doing a live chat thing. So we take away the issue of sounding like a human. All you got to do is type. Um, they are asked to creatively solve a problem, right? Someone comes to them with a problem. They have to understand the problem as it's been described, conceptualize what a solution for it is, and then explain it to the person in a way that they understand. That is at least a summary. Are you calling the Amazon chatbot art? Um, no, I'm saying that um, <laughs> precisely the opposite. The- You're stretching the hell out of the word creative yes. at this point. I think point. he was looking for like AIZ, which is some robot that goes around and paints things somewhere and then that wall's worth a million right. dollars. But, but that I think is the thing. If yeah, if you are prepared to define creativity as being what Bruce Dickinson does, then yeah, it's not getting replaced anytime soon. But I think all the little creative bits in everyone else's job may start to go away. But doing just doing something doesn't make it creative. Like when the Amazon rep, much as they do a very important job, gets a customer query, they're, what they're doing is fundamentally mechanical. They're getting an input, I have a problem, and they're trying to solve that problem, right? My point about creativity is when you create something that hasn't existed, whether it's art, whether it's music, whether it's writing, whether it's imagery, I think that um, creating something and having... A stylistic, I can't believe I'm saying these words, stylistic intent, right? You've got your own style. I know, I know. <laughs> Let's just take a moment to step over that one, okay? Um, <clears throat> I don't think your computer's going to do that. Like, I'd, that we've, we, I think computers will generate music. We've already seen it. There's that AI that <laughs> creates death metal, which sounds <laughs> like a lot of death metal, right? But does it sound like good death metal? No, of course it doesn't. Uh, I, I get, again, though, I think that's part of the point. Yeah, maybe it's not going to write an album which gets to the top of the charts and everybody says, are they death metal charts? I don't even know. Um, but which everyone says, <laughs> this is a great example of a death metal album. But if what you want is something which sounds plausibly death metal-y um, to go in the background of your but YouTube But who wants video, plausibly death metal I, I think a, when AI is truly a, any, turn the corner anybody, is not when it can almost faithfully kind of represent death metal from the past it's when the next great death metal genre comes from ai exactly uh, sh- that's what i'm no, talking I mean, about on that point i completely agree with you i just think that an awful lot of people think that that's the point that what we're aiming for here is a thing where an ai plausibly matches humanity's level of creativity and i think copy.ai is a perfect example of how that's not really the point at all. That's some kind of pointless future goal, like traveling to the stars, right? What we want is something where when someone says, I want some background music for this uh, advert that I'm making, they don't have to license the best death metal song on earth. They want something that sounds plausibly death metal And if you go, okay, here are my songs that you can license from the, the 10 best death metal bands on earth. That's 500,000 pounds for a, 
unlimited replay license and someone else goes here are some which they're not as good but i've got 25 million songs who are you going to subscribe to and this is how muzak.ai was founded yeah i mean this is literally i mean muzak's business model worked everyone sort of sneer also muzak is a lot less muzaki now because they listen <laughs> to people complaining <laughs> but but this is literally their business model and you can absolutely imagine instead of them you know hiring session musicians to do 101 strings play mantovani or whatever <laughs> um Instead, they say, okay, we'll just get music generating AI a bit better than it is now and then create yep. Muzak 2, all written by AI. This time at, it's personal. At that point, you never hire a session musician again. They have as much music as you could ever want, which can probably plausibly respond to, I would like a piece of music which is, um, which is thoughtful yet uh, inspirational. You know, so even the search engine for this thing, you don't even need to search through the music you've already written. It just generates you a piece of music on demand. You set that up, feed it a million NVIDIA cards, and then just go down the pub. <laughs> the, 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 the thing does You need to be running an AI business. You do. <laughs> the, the, the company doesn't That's take any plan. more work. That, that, that is literally my business plan. <laughs> what I, I think this is an important part of the discussion because... We talked about like the perception of what AI is, what the the goal of it is, right? And I think, I think for I would argue most people think of AI as ultimately being a computer being able to do something that a human being historically has, has done previously. And there's there are some things that you can automate very quickly and easily. In the same way that outside of AI, you know, we've seen robots in you know fulfillment centers and things like that. But I actually think that. Yeah, there's a reputation issue with AI. Like, I actually really like, I went to the, because I, I realized I'd actually, talking about copy.ai, I, I hadn't really thought about how they present themselves. And the way on their front page, what they say is copywriting simplified. And they say, introducing the end of writer's block with copy AI's automated creative creativity tools, you can generate marketing copy in seconds. And I like that because they're basically saying, this is a tool in your toolbox, but ultimately you need to create the copy. They're not saying, you know, no more copywriters, you know? They could very easily go down the overly sensational path of we'll replace your copywriters, but they don't do that. And maybe that's part of the problem with AI is that it's either in the perception of people or in the companies who are running these, it's presented as, okay, that's it. You know, all hail the, you know, the virtual army that's going to replace people. Well, and I think that ties back to... Jeremy, what you were saying that um you've got and the uh, the banjo thing and what have you, you've got a lot of people going, We do AI when at best they're doing ML and they may yeah. not be doing any of it at all and just reclassifying yeah. what they're already doing because AI sounds cool and trendy. At worst it's just a bunch of if statements. Yeah. It's like, I, 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 and there's no obvious line in my head between a script getting more complicated and you know, the fact that you're doing machine learning. It's like, well, I've got a SQLite database. Is that machine learning? It learns. It's a machine. What more do you want? Um, but, but, um, Let's talk about the AI ML thing because that, you, that I think you made a good point about this. And yeah. Jeremy, I'm interested in your thoughts on how you see this internally, that distinction. Maybe you can start out with, yeah, how would you, because for people who are unfamiliar with this topic, what is the difference? I mean, to me... AI is around intelli actual intelligence, which is the I in AI, where machine learning is just you feed it a corpus of things, it processes those things, and then can approximate, which was a good word you used before, Eck. It approximates what has happened and can then approximate other approximations of that thing. But it's not doing anything new, right? It's just an extension of what has been done, where creativity and actual intelligence, the ability to learn and add to the corpus without more data would be intelligence to me. Uh, now, um, I appreciate that um, we don't necessarily want to get into philosophy on this, but there is... An, but we're gonna. There is an ex <laughs> yeah, and we don't want to go too far down this, but part of the reason this conversation is difficult to have is you can make a pretty plausible case that when... Jono does something creative. What he's actually doing is synthesizing all the things that he's read before in his head. Right? When I'm writing something, or when he's writing music, or when someone's painting something, they're not really 
generating absolute newness from the void. <laughs> it's a thing which is influenced by... It's a patchwork by, of what, what's gone before. Uh, yeah. Literally everything is pastiche. I mean, th- this is a very postmodern discussion. <laughs> it's built on things that have come before, but if you look even at artists, let's say, there's a reflection of here's where we are on Earth and here's where we are and wherever that person is, and they take the things that have happened before and they synthesize something that resonates with the time in a way that ML is not capable of doing. So the Campbell soup can done at a different time probably wouldn't have turned into a thing. Like it was part of that time period and part, like there was a discovery there. That's a good point. Yeah. That I, I think is, well, he did not invent the Campbell soup can, obviously. Yeah. Putting it down in the way that he did at the time that he did took creativity. To be clear, I'm. Well, I was about to say I'm not disagreeing with you, and I possibly am disagreeing with you, but that's not the point. The point is that whether genuine creativity is possible or it's just all synthesis of what you've seen before, whatever, is a live issue among philosophers and has been for 4,000 years. <laughs> um, and so you've got a bunch of people saying um, AI can't do that kind of creativity, which I'm prepared to buy. But then you've got to have the argument about whether humanity could do that kind of creativity either, because maybe they can't. And and I think part of people's goal when they say AI is we're doing ML and it's AI, they're both the same thing, is because they don't think there is a fundamental distinction between those two parts. If you make ML sufficiently complicated, it is intelligent, QED. This is the point of the jury. Yeah, I mean, I guess I. that's a good point. If you want to get into that. That part of the philosophical argument, I, I like it I, never I, I ends. Don't, I, don't, I, just, I don't. To me, want like to. there's musicians <laughs> that, of course, they heard other music and they had a lot of people that influenced what they did. But there's some musicians that changed everything, and to me, that's the difference. And and on that note, often when that happens, it's one of two things, right? Either a mu- just using music as an example, it's either because a musician did something like genuinely new and different. So a good example here would be Jimi Hendrix, right? Jimi Hendrix played the guitar in a way that people hadn't really seen in that particular way back then. And he became hugely successful despite being a black guy and the amount of obviously, you know, racial pushback that he experienced in his life. And he had an impact because the music was so strong and he was it was so different. And then I think you get other musicians for example that will bridge two completely different worlds and do something that shouldn't work but it does and a good example of that is a band called baby metal where they combine like k-pop and metal which you would never have imagined working and they've been hugely successful i cannot believe that's a Um, thing that's a thing yeah and and but and so arguably the model in the computer wouldn't you know it when when stack ranking the the you know the the viability of a decision wouldn't combine the k-pop and metal thing because the model would have would assume that it wouldn't work and it'd be optimized for what's going to work like i would argue that if a computer tries to create to tries to be creative it spit it spits out britney spears a lot faster than it spits out iron maiden because it's optimized towards popularity so so there's a couple of interesting points there the first one is um if i were to make a computer algorithm that spat out britney spears and then i got to keep the royalties i would be fine with that <laughs> <laughs> but more importantly fine i will buy uh, i'll spot you the argument that there are uh, musicians who generally create new genres or take things in a new direction or whatever but the key point here is you don't have to do that for success. I mean, take Airborne no. as an example, right? Who are a great band, but amazing band. Pretty much everyone who's ever heard an Airborne song think they're basically an ACDC tribute band, and they have a point. But it's not uh, an unreasonable <laughs> yeah. view of Airborne. But uh, if you haven't listened to any Airborne, you like ACDC. By the way, you will love Airborne. Just go and buy all. They're of amazing. Their they're great. Amazing it's such band. a good band. I've seen and them you've live, seen them live, and I haven't. I and have, that continues and very to pain pleased. me. Um, but here's the point, right? If your algorithm does the equivalent of creating Airborne. That is, it's not doing something genuinely creative which moves the needle. It's just doing producing more of what you had already because now you've got more of it. That's fine. And uh, and part of what I was trying to get at earlier is I think that's about 90% of what people do is not genuinely superbly innovative. And I think that's the stuff which is likely to get picked up by 
by AI in exactly the same way that an awful lot of the repetitive natures of people's jobs are being automated away because getting a computer to do it is cheaper. I mean, part of the question for me is, is AI even a thing yet? Because it, it seems like we're always a year away from AI. And then the next wave of innovations come and they're like, yeah, we're like a year yeah. away. And it seems it's like the be, year of the Linux desktop. Right, exactly. <laughs> They'll be the same year. Whatever year it happens or, to be, or, or, or the year of the Linux VR. desktop and the year that AI happens, same year. Yeah, in VR yeah. is when it will happen. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean... I get what you're saying about the airborne example, but I think that is making out that um, <clears throat> that, that that presupposes that um, that to create an airborne song, for example, even though it fits the ACDC recipe pretty closely, there's still a massive level of variance oh, in absolutely. creating I... a great ACDC style song. So that you could very easily create a a, a mundane yeah right. I, I do not for a moment think that what we have now could create airborne but i feel like you can see it on the horizon in a way yeah that you it's not couldn't. far off yeah looking at things like this person does not exist and what it does with photos you think well if you basically did that with music and pointed it at the song doesn't of, exist yeah this uh, yeah this uh, this acdc song does not exist I feel like it would generate something, and then if I told you this is an airborne album, you go, it's not a very good airborne album, but you wouldn't go, absolutely not, it was produced by a Ruby script. <laughs> but, <laughs> and maybe we're not there yet, but I feel like we could be in five years or whatever. I, 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 it doesn't feel like there's a step change in between where we are now and that. It does feel like there's a step change between where we are now and it writes operas. I have to say, I, the, the point you made about is AI just a super powerful version of ML? Like, so it's just a really complicated. M I'm kind of of that viewpoint. Like, I mean, surely ML is just a means to an end to AI. It's. Um, I mean, when ML can write its own algorithm for the next ML, then yes, because then it has uh, learned. Then yes, that, uh, uh, that's uh, you're describing the singularity. Hooray! You get a hard, have, hard, yeah. hard take, hard take off at that point. Um, <laughs> a, a discussion which we're not going to get into because at best we'll attract a bunch of rationalist lunatics <laughs> um, so <laughs> not interested in that um, but yeah I, th I think one of the other things I wanted to um, bring this around to is the European Union have started thinking about legislation around AI surprise surprise of course well, they have. Well, absolutely. Um, but uh, but <laughs> so I th they do. Yeah. Um, but I think I think you're phrasing this like it's a bad thing, and doing legislation about dangerous technologies seems like an okay idea to me. No. Uh, I, 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 well, just before you get into it, to be very clear about this, two concerns. One is, as we've seen countless times in the past, log legislation rarely impacts innovation right people are going to go on and use technology and you get the streisand effect okay when when people do tend to do that kind of thing and secondly the eu much as i'm was all for i don't want to get into brexit but i was all for <laughs> um staying in the in the european union because i think it, it makes a lot of sense but the eu has known form on ridiculously invasive levels of, of legislation oh yeah i so, I, I, I would that, certainly agree with nervous for two reasons yeah, yeah. <laughs> i i um but anyway carry on so I, did, I didn't read the whole thing. I don't know if you did. It was it's quite long. Um, but in reading some of the summaries and reading parts of it, like the GDPR, it contains some very odd ideas about what technology is, what this industry is, the structure of this industry that suggests to me, once again, the drafters really haven't actually tried to understand what they're trying to regulate, which means much like the GDPR, it will be rife with unintended consequences. And it almost seems to me with this one, they've approached this as if with the GDPR, if they were, were trying to regulate data stores. Like, AI is going to be a small part of everything. So trying to regulate AI doesn't seem like the right level of abstraction to me because consumer credit is going to be different than healthcare is going to be different than, you know, consumer-facing things. So regulating AI in the abstract seems weird because you, re you wouldn't regulate privacy at the data store level. Yeah, I mean, I agree no. with all of these things, and I do. I think the GDPR is a very good example. Um, like you said, unintended consequences. Now, I have not read the whole set of proposals because it's like 
because you had to check that pages. cookie box every single page. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, um, but but I I think it's interesting that um at least some people are sitting down and saying we need to think about how this works. Now, Jeremy, I kind of buy your point that regulating how you use AI is weird in the same way that you don't regulate things with a letter K in them, right? <laughs> because it's a thing which happens everywhere. But on the flip side of that. An awful lot of the people who would say we well, can't regulate AI in the abstract are people who want who want to go. Yeah, there shouldn't be any kind of big picture regulation on this. Let's just fritter it away in loads of tiny little bits that don't actually take a big picture. And I think attempting to do something, uh, put uh, put some kind of a framework in place about how people should use AI techniques, even if you have a bunch of arguments about whether this thing qualifies as AI and um, how that fits into this other industry. I think it's a good idea to have it in the same way that I think the GDPR is, on balance, a good idea, even if I think the implementation is... It could be a hell of a lot better than it is. (laughs) Do you think your privacy has meaningfully been improved by the GDPR? Yeah. Okay. I do, because I think one of the things that it has done is made people think about it. Even if people are not actually changing the way they act because of fear of GDPR enforcement, hmm. what it's done is it's made the conversation... I mean, you could say the current discussions we're having around privacy and the way Apple have gone into things, or, other, or the way Google have gone into things, or whatever, would have ha- that would have happened and played out exactly as it was, even if the EU had done nothing and just you know, gone aboard baguette and then gone home, no problem. But I don't think that's the case. I think one of the things they are able to do with this sort of legislation is surface it in a way that can't just be brushed aside and ignored. Because if you because if you're a company, you have to care at least a bit about what they think or go, okay, I'm not going to sell to these billion people. And that's a big deal. The, the the concern that I have here is I have no issue. I think regulate you need regulation, right? In many many different industries, it's just how you build a, a, an equitable planet for everybody. Yeah. <laughs> um, the the but it, it it requires a couple of things. It requires the people who create the, the the legislation and 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 the regulation. It requires those people to know what they're fucking talking about. Is step number one. Right. And to understand yeah. not just the theoretical risks or the theoretical implement, implement, uh, um, uh, implications for something, but the reality of the world that we live in. Right. And invariably on that level, you get people who fall into one of two camps. They're either massive capitalists or they are anti capitalists. And there is a, there's a balancing function there. So people who know what they're talking about in, in the reality of the world that we live in. And the second thing is you need, um, like people who can actually regulate and and do this work well, right? And that's my issue with the EU is I just think they've got so much bad precedent and history that's there. I just don't trust that they'll do a good job. Like I'm not a Republican, but I think a lot of governments are just not very good at running these kinds of programs. Or and, and but to your point, Ak. Okay, well, if we presume that, well, okay, well, how do you do it, right? And in my mind. The solution is, is that you is that you influence and you work with the people who are building the platforms and the systems. Like when we talked about Flock, for example, in the last in the previous show, or the one before last, that's a decision that Google's making, right, and that's impacting um, Chrome, right. To me, that's where the conversation needs to happen. Not a bunch of people who are sat in Brussels making decisions about these kinds of things. I just don't think it's effective. And time and time again, we've seen over and over again, people try to regulate new technology. It just doesn't work. It's never worked. And it, it won't work. They'll, they will not be able to regulate AI. It just will not happen. I'm willing to make that a prediction. <laughs> that and Facebook spaces. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and it's scary because AI genuinely can be risky. You know, talking about open AI a little bit, um, you know, they were that that's the the premise of it, right, was that they were set up to 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 create AI that's going to be for the betterment of humanity, which I think is a great thing to focus on. But then, you know, last year they made the you know ex- they gave exclusive access to Microsoft for for the source code. Oh well, yeah, this is exactly it. It's um, which is concerning. It, it's like, licensed licensed to them exclusively. I don't really understand the terms of 
how this so, works. So the, the algorithm itself used to be open. Now that it's only Microsoft can contribute to the code and see the code, but anyone yep. can use the API. And the APIs are publicly open for everybody. Yep. But Microsoft, right. Microsoft can take that and modify the code and improve it yep. and put it into their own products, which what a counterintuitive thing for uh, see, but, to do. For, but to Someone my, said but they should my... change their name to closed AI. Well, well <laughs> from, from, from my point of view, and um, I appreciate I sound like Karl Marx when I go on about this sort of thing, but, the, <laughs> but, but exactly, I think, John, the counterargument to what you were saying, yeah, I'll totally buy. Governments are bad at regulating this sort of thing and tend to um, – the decisions tend to be made by a bunch of people who are good at internal political jockeying in their own countries and aren't AI experts right. and whatever. I will buy all of that. But the flip side is one of the things that regulation stops is things like, hey, we've got this great new thing. Oh, no, now only one company can have it. <laughs> so well, we already so, have it. We already uh, have existing. Uh, you see, we already uh, have existing capabilities for that, right? For breaking up companies. Part of the thing here is that I don't necessarily think we have... If you look at the EU stuff, we're, um, they're still at the level of saying things like, you know what, existing laws apply to AI. <laughs> you know, I, I, don't think they're, I don't think they're really at a point of saying, yeah, we're going we're gonna to lock down the AI market because we don't understand the potential of the technology. People are still deciding things like, if an algorithm does an illegal thing, is it illegal? Who, who gets punished yep. for this, right? There's not, yeah, even, yeah, yeah. there's not even a basic level of how does this stuff fit into society? And it's, and there are, and if you look at things like, um, take a Bitcoin and what it does to currency and the way currency markets work, or ta if you look at, um, a company like Uber or ride sharing companies generally, or, um, uh, what they call gig economy companies generally and how they fit into the way work yep. works and is funded. And they're essentially hacks against the existing systems, which work because there's a hole there that people didn't think of. And it's that kind of level of legislation I think is needed for AI. I don't think anyone's talking about we're going to regulate this and that and the other to this level. It's stupid things like, who, 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 if, if someone makes a decision and one of the inputs into that decision was what the Python script on their laptop told them to do, are they allowed to blame the Python script if it turns out there was a problem? Can AI be negligent? You but know? this is the challenge with this. As, this is the challenge of this as an overall topic is ah. just scoping the problem, I think, is, is, a, is an issue. And I think yeah. with a lot and of it, with a lot of people who regulate, you give them an inch and they'll take a mile. Yes. And that, to me, this, to me, the solution with this is going to, the market will respond in the same way that. <laughs> The, the, oh man! Let, it, well, you, hang on, hang you, on, hang on. You want to talk hang about on, people? Let me, let me let, go on. Let, let me let me make this point, right? And, okay. and also the, the the problem with the market responding, right? So, for example, right, we know that there is a significant risk of people uh, of of bots on the internet, and the market has responded with captures and these kinds of tools that 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 people can use to mitigate against that issue. Now, arguably, a government could have tried to regulate against that. And that would not have worked. So what happened is a problem manifested itself in the world and another set of companies will create solutions for that. In the same way that years ago, we all had the same password, right? And we knew that that was a problem because it was loads of data leaks. So now, oh, well, we all have to have different passwords now. Okay, well, now you get companies like LastPass that will solve that problem. To me, that's how the world has operated and has done for hundreds of years, right? The problem with this is that it's fine for people like us, but for people who are technically less literate, it's fucking confusing, right? So the regulation, I think, is good for protecting people who don't know a lot about technology because people like us, we tend to use LastPass because we're technically literate to know what the problem is and then find a solution for the problem, right? But I think for a lot of people who aren't in that in that boat, just understanding the problem and what the problem is, um, they're the most vulnerable people and that's where the market doesn't always provide the solution. But I just don't think you can regulate this stuff. It, it's never worked. I think what you tend to get regulation with is big, heavy industry. You get regulation around energy and things like that because there's a very small number of players that are involved. But with something like AI, where there's already hundreds and hundreds of companies and millions of people using it, you cannot regulate that. So I'm just not convinced by it. We'll see what happens, and I'm happy to be proven wrong if it works, but I just don't think it's going to work. So It will be interesting to see how all this plays out. Yes. I think. Yeah. Yeah. 
And it will be interesting to see that when the negative elements of AI manifest, what are the solutions that other companies, like in the same way that I mentioned LastPass and as all needing to have different passwords. I think the internet is a more secure place because we all now have these ridiculously complicated passwords. There's no doubt about it. Um, but we um, we absolutely need, that wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for people like LastPass creating those things. So, all right, we should wrap up. I would like to know um, what our audience thinks about this because we, we've covered, we said we weren't going to talk about philosophy, but we did. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. It's fun. It is. It uh, is. What do you think? What do you think, folks? Do you think AI is, uh, well, a couple of questions. First of all, go to that, is this a real face site? And let us know if you can spot faces because I am genuinely curious to see whether some of us are just not very good at spotting faces and other people are. <laughs> um what do you think about AI? Where do you think it's going? Do you think we will get to a point where, you know, it's going to be, they were going to be replacing various roles and especially creative roles? Like, I'd like to understand that as well. Yeah. All right. Shall we? Let's do it. Bye, everyone. Bye.